The Gospel according to Luke chapter 6, verses 12 through 16. Hear now the word of the Lord as he speaks through the evangelist, Luke. In these days, he went out to the mountain to pray. And all night he continued in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples and chose from them twelve, whom he named apostles. Simon, whom he named Peter, and Andrew his brother, and James and John, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who was called the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. This is God's holy and inspired word. The grass withers, the flower fades. The word of our God stands forever. One of the most difficult doctrines to wrap our minds around is the doctrine of the sovereignty of God. The sovereignty of God. Is God really sovereign? And if so, how far does his sovereignty extend? Is he just sovereign over things that we like? Or is he sovereign over all things? In Reformed theology, we say that God's decree, that's how we describe everything that has ever happened. From creation to election to providence, God's orchestrating of all things throughout history. God's decree includes all things and that he is working all things out. Here's the important part. This is probably the hardest part to wrap our mind around. He's working all things out for his glory and for the good of his people. And so what we say is that God truly is sovereign over all things. So when you hear this term, God is sovereign, what we mean by that is that God is sovereign. Our confession puts it this way. God, from all eternity, did, by the most wise and holy counsel of his own will, freely and unchangeably ordain whatsoever comes to pass. Now, the Scottish Presbyterians did not make this doctrine up, but rather they got it from prominent passages such as Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11. We have been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things, according to the counsel of his will. To the praise of his glory. Wow. That's big. That's heavy. And all things here means all things. But then people ask, does that even include the things that we, that, that we think of as bad? Genesis chapter 50. Bye-bye. <laughs> that was pretty cute. Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. Joseph says, As for you, you meant it for evil against me, but God meant it for good. We know that passage, right? But it's hard to wrap our minds around, especially when bad things are happening to us. But God means this for good somehow. That's hard, to, that's hard to understand. But here's the thing. God is operating at a level that is infinitely higher than we can even begin to comprehend. The view from his throne, as I like to say, is much different from the view that we have here on earth. And we see this in today's passage, which details our Lord Jesus after a long night of prayer, choosing his 12 apostles, including the one whom God would permit Satan to sift and put Jesus on the cross. So the point of the sermon is for us to see the extent of God's sovereignty, which extends even to the choosing of Judas, the traitor, 
as one of the apostles, the inner circle, one of the most trusted, one of Jesus' friends. And we ask, why? So that God would bring about his purposes for his glory and for our good. And we have to remember that. It's for his glory. So in order for us to see the extent of God's sovereignty, first we'll consider Jesus on the mountain. Second, his choosing of the twelve. And third, the traitor, Judas. So let's begin with Jesus on the mountain. Verse 12, in these days, remember he's facing lots of opposition. The Pharisees are coming after him. They decided last week that because Jesus honors the Sabbath in a biblical way, not according to made-up traditions, that they need to kill him. So with all this opposition, in these days... Jesus went to the mountain to pray, and he continued in prayer all night. It's a vigil, an all-night vigil of prayer. One verse, right? One insignificant verse, just the beginning of our passage. It's not that important, right? It's insignificant. But actually, there's a lot here. First, what is prayer? What is prayer? Prayer is an offering up of our desires unto God for things that are agreeable to His will. In the name of Christ, with confession of sin and thankful acknowledgement of God's mercy. Whereas the second part of that definition does not apply to our Lord Jesus because no sin, and thus he doesn't need to confess his sin, and therefore he doesn't need God's mercy. He doesn't need to say, in my name I pray. He just prays. He's the mediator. He's the intercessor through whom we pray. But the first part of that does apply to our Lord Jesus. Prayer is an offering up of our desires unto God for things agreeable to his will. Oh, Lord, please give me that Porsche. Do you think that's something that's agreeable to God's will? I mean, perhaps it is, but is that something that we ought to be praying for? For things that are agreeable to his will. If our Lord Jesus desired to choose a particular group of men whom he would send out to preach the gospel, to administer the sacraments and church discipline, and he wanted that group of men to be the precise group whom his father had chosen for that duty, then what do we think would be the way in which Jesus would find that information out? Answer, by speaking to his Father through prayer. And if prayer is important for Jesus, the Son of God in the flesh, who are we to think we don't need to pray? Jesus prays at the most important times during his ministry. He actually prays all the time, but he prays It's mentioned by the evangelist that he prays at the most important times during his ministry. For example, the Garden of Gethsemane. The upper room, his last night with his apostles. The transfiguration. These are really important times in his ministry. And here is another important, significant, vital part of the ministry of our Lord Jesus, facing all of the opposition that we've seen over the last few weeks and making that important decision, the selection, the choosing of the twelve. So it's no surprise that we see our Lord Jesus here praying to his Father. Through prayer, Jesus is seeking wisdom from God, insight into his Father's will and strength for when that will is made clear. Jesus has to say to the one who he knows is going to betray him, and you, Judas, follow me. You're in my inner circle. Jesus has to say that. Jesus is seeking God's will through prayer. And something for us here to remember is that even in prayer, God is sovereign, okay? And so that means when we pray, we're not trying to change God's mind. We're not trying to have him conform to our will. It's the exact opposite. We're asking that he would change our minds, that he would sanctify us, that he would bend our wills. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
I think a lot of us, when we pray that, are thinking, my will be done. Thy will be done. Second, note the location of Jesus' prayer, a mountain. Now, why does that matter? Is it because I miss, the one thing I miss about California is mountains? Is that why? I lied. Also Mexican food. But why is it important that there's a mountain mentioned here? That's the location of Jesus' prayer. Not just because mountains are awesome, but in the Holy Scriptures, mountains represent an ascent up to God and communion with Him. Mountains in the Holy Scriptures represent an ascent up to God and communion with Him. We see several prophets doing this in the Old Testament. For example, Adam served God and had communion with Him on a holy mountain. And if you wonder if that's really true, come to discuss the sermon after the service today. Adam served God and had communion with Him on a holy mountain. Where did Moses go up to pray and receive the Ten Commandments? On a mountain. Where did Elijah call upon God? On a mountain. And it was David who rhetorically, with respect to the coming Messiah, said, Who will ascend the mount of the Lord and who will stand in his holy place? And finally, in the New Testament of the book of Hebrews, the author of Hebrews in his sermon says that when we worship God, we have come to holy Mount Zion, heavenly Jerusalem. And guess who is at the top of that mountain on his throne? God himself. So yeah, mountains are pretty cool, both in real life and in the Holy Scriptures. And the fact that Jesus ascends the mountain for communion and prayer with God is an emphasis on his prophetic office, and it highlights his messianic status. Third, consider the duration of his prayer. How long was Jesus in prayer on the mountain? A few seconds? A few minutes? A few hours? All night. Jesus, the eternally begotten Son of God in the flesh, in order to commune with his Father, in order to ensure his choosing of the twelve was according to the will of his Father, in order to make sure the right men were chosen for the apostolic calling, in order to make sure that these men and their strengths and weaknesses in order to get men with the right skills and gifts, cowardice and love of money, in order to make sure the right men for the commission and for the crucifixion were selected, he spent the entire night in prayer. Think about that next time you think it's a waste of time to pray. Oh, I don't have time to pray. And when you think that when we come to the mountain here on the Lord's Day, that ah, the prayers are just too long. I'm going to find another church. The prayers are too long. Next time you think that. So what we've considered here is what prayer is, the location of prayer, and the duration of his prayer. And fourth, what is the result of his prayer? And that brings us to our second consideration the choosing of the twelve. The twelve. Who are these men? Luke tells us that from his disciples, that's the larger group of followers, Jesus chose twelve apostles. So what's an apostle? It comes from the Greek word apostolos, which means sent ones. So these are the men whom Jesus personally chose to send out, to preach, to teach, to exercise authority on his behalf. And after his resurrection and before his ascension, it's the ones whom he commissions to preach and teach and administer the sacraments and church discipline. The apostles. It's a word that is perhaps misunderstood or used incorrectly. You see, there was a larger group, and those are called the disciples. And disciple means student, learner, pupil, someone who follows Jesus in their life. And there are disciples today, just as there were 2,000 years ago, 1,000 years ago, and here in this sanctuary. If you are a Christian, you are a disciple. See how that works? All followers of Christ are students, learners, pupils of Christ. And the classroom is the Christian life. So if you are a Christian, you are a disciple. 
the 12 apostles, they were chosen from the disciples, and they are a particular group of men whom Jesus hand-selected. So do you think there are apostles today? No, they died. They died. They didn't live forever. Right? Ephesians 2.21, Paul calls them, along with the prophets, the foundation of the church. They are foundational because the Holy Spirit used them to write the Holy Scriptures. And foundations aren't laid over and over, especially when it comes to the church of Christ. So the apostles whom we see here are men chosen by Christ himself, sent by Christ himself. That's what the word apostle means. Apostle isn't a word that we should throw around uh, lightly, apply it to just anyone. And if someone ever tells you they are an apostle, go the other way because they're probably in a cult. Or they're crazy. Or, most likely, both. Jesus chooses his 12 apostles as a result of spending the night in prayer. So who are these men? Who are the 12, as they're often called? They consist of sinners, tax collectors, Galilean fishermen, Jewish nationalists. They are imperfect men from Israel, most from Galilee, from Bethsaida. And yet, as imperfect and as unassuming as these men are, in God's sovereign plan for human history, for the history of redemption, including the cross, these are the men whom God chose, whom Jesus selected personally to carry out his purposes. First, we have arguably the most famous of all the apostles, Simon, whom he named Peter. Simon from the Hebrew Simeon and Peter from the Greek rock or stone. He would later go to Rome from where he wrote his canonical apostles and was eventually crucified during the reign of Nero. And his brother Andrew, which I love his name, it means manly or masculine or brave. He would go on to preach the gospel in Greece where he too would be crucified. Then we have James and John. James is simply a Hellenized form of Yaakov, Jacob. So really, everyone you know named James, their real name is Jacob. Then we have John, his brother, not John the Baptist. That's a different John. Two very popular names at that time. These are brothers who left their father and their careers as fishermen behind so that they could follow Jesus out of a life of fishing fish so that they would fish men. James the Apostle was the first of the apostles to be martyred. Did you know that? Chapter 12, verse 1 of the book of Acts. Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. So beheading. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he also arrested Peter. That's James the Apostle. Not to be confused with James uh, the Less or James the Younger. Not to be confused with James the brother of Jesus. There were a lot of James back then, right? It's a popular name back in uh, the year zero. It's also a popular name today. I think we have three in our church. When I was a kid, we had three in my kindergarten class. You know, you had like James B, James C, and James D. Uh, and eventually you start calling one of them Jimmy. And then you call the other one Jim, and then one James. So there's like, you know, a derivation of all of them. It's a popular name. That's right. You got it, Will. His brother is John, another popular name, who is the author of the gospel according to John. Have you ever heard of that one? He also authored 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And he also, when he was on the island called Patmos for the word of God, is the one whom on the Lord's day Jesus revealed what we now call the book of Revelation to. He became a prominent figure later in the church of Ephesus, and he is the one whom Jesus entrusted with taking care of his mother. Remember that? On the cross, Jesus said, John, this is your mother. Mother, this is your son. Another important figure in church history. He is the only one, so far as we know, who was not martyred. He did suffer for the gospel, but he was not martyred. Next, Philip, not to be confused with Philip the deacon. The apostle Philip was also from Bethsaida. He is the one who, in the upper room, said to Jesus, Jesus, just show us the Father. Stop talking about him. Show us the Father. And Jesus said, Philip, have I been with you this long and you still don't know me? 
if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Philip eventually went to what we call modern-day Turkey, or as the Turks want us to call them, turkey yay turkey yay You don't have to call them that, by the way. They don't pronounce our name correctly, so you don't have to call them that. And in modern day, uh, what we call modern-day Turkey, he was beheaded for preaching the gospel. Starting to catch a pattern, what happens to the apostles. Next, Luke names Bartholomew, the one whom Jesus saw sitting under the fig tree, also called Nathaniel in some of the gospels. Nathaniel Bartholomew has the most gruesome death of all the apostolic martyrdoms as he was flayed alive for preaching the gospel in Armenia. Matthew is, of course, the Levi, the tax collector. We've already discussed him, the one who threw a dinner banquet for Jesus, the author of the gospel, Matthew. He later preached in Ethiopia where he was killed on the Lord's Day in the front of the church by the sword. Thomas, also known as the twin, the doubter who challenged Jesus, I'll never believe in the resurrection unless Jesus appears to me personally and I can see him and I can put my hands in his side and my fingers in his wounds. And then Jesus appears in that dramatic post-resurrection appearance and he says, oh, hey, Thomas, is this good enough for you? Go ahead. Put your hand here. Touch my side. Put your, hand in, put your fingers in my hand. Is that good enough for you, Thomas? And then he says, do you believe because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet have believed. All Thomas says is, my Lord and my God. Thomas went to India to plant churches, churches that are still there today and boast his apostolic planting presence. And he was killed by the spear in India. James, the son of Alphaeus, known as James the Lesser, James the Younger, in order to distinguish him from all the other Jameses, was crucified in Egypt preaching the gospel. Simon the Zealot, the Jewish nationalist, that was another party along with um, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Herodians, the Essenes. He also had a group called the Zealots who wanted to remove Rome from Judea. Uh, he is also known as Simon the Cananean because he was from Cana where the first canonical miracle was performed. So he was likely there at the party. Some even say that that was his wedding that Jesus was at. He was likely martyred preaching the gospel either in Persia or Georgia, not the one in our country, the one in Eurasia. Finally, Judas, the son of James, also known as Thaddeus or Jude Thaddeus. He was with Bartholomew in Armenia when he was martyred and was later martyred by the axe when preaching the gospel in Lebanon. Now, as we consider these men, the apostles, the ones whom Jesus chose by hand for himself to preach, teach, administer the gospel, administer the sacraments and church discipline. What did they all have in common? They all suffered for the gospel. Pick up your cross and follow me, Jesus said. He didn't say, hey, you know what? It's going to be great. Pick up your teddy bear, pick up your pillow, get your down comforter, and let's go. It's going to be great. He said, pick up your cross and follow me. The cross is an instrument, was an instrument of shame, of grief, of pain, of execution. Pick up your cross and follow me. In the face of opposition from the Jews, from the Greeks, from the Romans, from all kinds of pagans, these are the men whom Christ used to establish his church. What does this show us? It shows us God's sovereignty, even over the enemy, the one who opposes the Christ and his spiritual children. It shows us the power of the offspring of the woman over the power of the serpent. As Jesus himself said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against me. A mighty fortress is our God. Not all of the original 12 were able to receive that great commission, though, were they? Not all of the 12 were there when Jesus appeared to them after the resurrection. Because in God's sovereignty and in his infinite wisdom, he permitted Satan to take one. Judas, the traitor. And that brings us to our final consideration 
verse 16c, after listing the 11, those who would suffer for the sake of Christ and for his gospel, he lists the one who would suffer because of his own sin, because of his own greed, because of his love of money, Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. Judas is mentioned as the one who had the money bag, which is a warning to anyone who seeks power and influence in the church through money. As Paul writes in 1 Timothy 6, 9, For those who desire to be rich fall into temptation. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils, and it is through this craving that some have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. We don't know if Paul had Judas in mind when he wrote that, but we know that the love of money caused Judas to betray our Lord Jesus. 30 pieces of silver in today's currency, about 300 bucks. That's all it took. And Jesus knew it. That's the craziest part about this whole story, is that Jesus knows it. Remember, he selected these men after a long night of prayer and communion with his father. He didn't choose Judas arbitrarily. He chose Judas because the lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world had to be slain in time because of the betrayal of his own friend. Psalm 41.9, even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted his heel against me. When the Lord Jesus sat down with his apostles at the Passover meal and instituted the Lord's Supper. Do you remember that scene? You remember the scene where Jesus is sitting there with the 12 eating, institutes the Lord's Supper, and he says to them, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they became very sorrowful and began to say to one another, this shows the human condition. They didn't even know if it was going to be them or not. They said, is it I? Rabbi, is it me? And he said, he who has dipped his hand in the dish will betray me. For the Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for him if he had never been born. And Judas said, Rabbi, is it I? And he said, you have said it. John tells us that Satan entered into Judas. Just think about that. In the same way that Satan commandeered the serpent in Genesis 3, he commandeered Judas. When Judas betrayed our Lord Jesus, Satan sifted him. Your mind now. Reminds us that even in the church, Right? Even in the church, there are those whom Satan is after, whom Satan will use, which is why the Apostle Peter says, the devil is around every corner seeking those whom he may devour. Be on guard. And Jesus knows it. Remember what he said to him in the garden? Do you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? Indeed, he was chosen for that reason. And we hear this and we think, how can this be? How can this be? But the answer is in the Holy Scriptures. After the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, the Apostle Peter, who had himself denied Jesus three times, is now standing up in front of the Jews and preaching. And he said this, Men of Israel... Now, he's preaching to some of those who opposed Jesus in his ministry, who sought to see Jesus on the cross. Now, listen. He said, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed him. Through the hands of lawless men. Even the worst thing that has ever happened in human history, and that is the only innocent person who has ever lived, being betrayed, beaten, mocked, scourged, 
nailed to a Roman cross and killed. That is the worst thing that's ever happened in human history. It was all part of God's plan. God's sovereignty extends to all things. The most important things. And so when we think about that, wouldn't it extend to everything in our lives? Things that we like, things that we don't like. Is God still sovereign? He is. If he knows when a bird dies, then he cares about you. God is in control of even the smallest things. His sovereignty extends to all things. We see that here today as we consider Jesus on the mountain, as we see him selecting the twelve, even the one whom God would permit Satan to enter into and help to get him on the cross. And as sad and as terrible as this seems, beloved, this is how you were saved, by Jesus going to the cross. It was according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God that sinners like ourselves would be brought into the body of Christ, would turn from that sin and turn to God and be justified, be adopted into his household. And throughout our lives, through the ministry that Jesus still exercises authority through, be sanctified and preserved and kept for Christ on the day he is revealed. And so the sovereignty of God should give the Christian comfort encouragement, and great assurance that just as God was working out all things 2,000 years ago, he's doing the same now for his glory and for our good. As Joseph said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And we see that in no clearer place than the cross of our Lord Jesus.